This is Modern Homesteading. So in today's video, we're gonna talk a little bit about crosscut saws. No self-respecting woods, but just a tiny little center. Beautiful. Now to secure our sheath to uh, our saw, we're gonna to want to use, well, I'm gonna use rope today. I'm gonna to cut about four pieces, about two feet long. Now what would be a cleaner and uh, much more, a better, much better style would be to use uh, some leather or some webbing and you could pop rivet it onto the sheath itself and with the buckle pop rivet on the other side. So you could some, figure a device, some type of a buck, buckle, like an old shoe buckle or something, where when you take this off, it doesn't fall off. One thing that I don't like uh, to do when I'm in the forest is keep track of a lot of tools. So it's, it's every way you can simplify that uh, is nice. So having one piece to look after instead of five pieces to look after is advantageous. But I don't have that pop rivets right now, so this is what I'll do. So there we have it, our fire hose sheath. Wanda is sorted out and in uh, back in fighting trim. I promised you guys at the end of the video uh, that I would talk a little bit about the history of this saw and a little bit of the difference about some of the crosscut saws, so you can look at them and see kind of what they were intended for. The crosscut saws come in basically four different varieties. Well, I could really narrow it down to three. This saw right here is a six and a half foot felling saw. And a felling saw, what that means, that's a saw that you use to cut down a tree. And what makes a felling saw different than a, than a bucking saw is a, a couple things. A felling saw is gonna have a real strong sweep in it. As you saw, as I was polishing this, it's got a real strong curve in it. It's also going to be more flexible and thinner in the curve. It's going to be a thinner material. The reason for that is that this is a saw that's made to cut horizontally. Two guys would work this to cut a tree down side to side. So having it thinner and lighter makes it easier to work with and to hold it up because you're fighting against gravity the whole time. The reason why it's got this big wet, this big radius in it is that you can get a, a wedge in there sooner. So because the saw is going in quicker at the belly, you can start driving wedges in. So that was the main reason. Now when you run into a saw that's flat on the back side, like this one here, this saw was, this is about a five foot saw, and you can see that it's flat on the back, and it's much thicker in the kerf. And this is what you would call a traditional uh, a bucking saw. This would be used like this uh, to cut your tree once it's down on the ground to lengths. And that's why weight didn't matter so much. Actually, weight works in your advantage and that you're not fighting gravity cutting sideways so the curve doesn't matter so much. So this, if you see them flat on the back, is a bucking saw. The curve is a felling saw. Now there are some, some combination saws out there. I've never used one or seen one uh, that were kind of designed to do both. So I don't know a lot about those. The fourth that I alluded to would be the single saw, which you've seen me, I've got it up there on the wall, but uh, made for, for one man. But that's typically it. The old saws, when it came to length, uh, they were, would come anywhere from about three foot in length, clear up to 16 foot. So the saws would be, from, from the, the shortest up to seven feet were a six inch increment. So it would be three and a half, four, four and a half, five, five and a half up to seven. After seven feet, they jump by 12 inch incre increments. So they would go seven, eight, nine, 12. And the biggest that I've ever heard of is a 16 footer. They actually made 16s uh, for cutting the giant sequoias in California and in the or northern or southern Oregon coast. So that is basically the skinny on the uh, quick and dirty on the saws. There's a lot to this. Um, one thing that I'm, that I'm really excited about, well, I'll share it with you now because I just, it, it's official now, is I just signed up or got to signed up for a, um, a five day cross cut class put on by the Forest Service. The, the guys that actually knew, know how to set these saws up, how to sharpen them, how to set, set the teeth, how to use them prop, you know, to really maintain them are, are dying um, at a very rapid rate or are pretty much are gone. There, there's only just a handful of people that still maintain that skill. 
Fortunately, uh, the Forest Service at the Nine Mile Station in Missoula, Montana, they run a, uh, they have a class there that keeps this tradition alive. It's the only one that I know about, and it's hard to get into. I've been trying to get into it for years, and I actually just got into it, and I'll be attending it at the end of March. Um, so I'm looking forward to that because I have used these saws, but I really don't know how to properly file them and set the rakers. It is truly an art, and um, I'm looking forward to learning how to do that. So I can't share that with you because I really don't know how, but I will be learning. So if you have interest in attending that class, um, I know that I got signed up today way before they even have the schedule announced, and there were already people signing up for it. Contact me privately, and I will... Um, uh, give you that information. Uh, they're offering two this year, I believe. So, um, yeah, Missoula, Montana, if you're interested in that. I, I will be there. Um, so that's it. Is there anything else? If you haven't picked up one of these crosscut saws or you don't own, own one yet, now's the time. You know, they don't make these anymore. They are very, very uh, special and irreplaceable. And to find one in good condition like this that hasn't all been pitted and rusted is really rare. You know, be careful when you're buying one. You can take out a certain amount of rust or take off a certain amount of rust, but if you find that it's really, really pitted, there's nothing you can do with that. And the fact that that's pitted and it'll have kind of an orange, orangey peel uh, shape covering on it or texture to it, that's going to drag in the kerf. It's going to be a saw that's much more difficult to use. And there is no, you cannot grind it out. I mean, you can grind it out uh, with a belt sander and such, but you're going to get golf ball divots in it and it's not going to, it's not going to work properly. Uh, so be careful when you find one, just because you get a deal on it uh, and it's all rusty, it doesn't make it worthwhile. So make sure you try to find one that's been well cared for and in good condition. And ideally, it'd be nice to have about a five and a half footer uh, a cross cut saw, a five foot cross cut saw. Nice to have a five footer because you could actually run that by yourself if you had to. And then depending on what size of timber you might be looking at needing to get into, uh, a good felling saw like this in addition to the crosscut saw. Of course, this could be used for both. Uh, you could use either one for both, but uh, if you really want to get technical and specialized, um, that's, how it, um, that's how it breaks down. So I hope you enjoyed the video. This is just kind of an uh, introduction to it. I don't, don't know uh, as lot, uh, all that much about it myself. I am learning. It's something that's really interesting to me and I'm really excited about becoming, uh, having that skill uh, to be able to service these saws and, and to understand them and, and, and keep them sharp and tuned up and working properly. Because this is a, um, keeping your family warm is a, it's an important, important thing, an important skill. If you can't use a chainsaw or you don't have access to gasoline, um, something like this would be the difference between, well, life or death, not to be too dramatic, but it's not too far from the truth. I'm sorry, and you forgot, I promised I was going to tell you the history of, uh, of Wanda here. My grandparents um, were Okies, that means they were from oak farmers in Oklahoma, and uh, during the 20s and 30s, during the Dust Bowl, they uh, weren't, able, weren't able to farm. And so like um, many of the uh, Okies in the iconic story of Grapes of Wrath, uh, my grandparents uh, actually lived that. I once asked my grandfather if he'd read the book, Steinbeck's book, The Grapes of Wrath, and he said, no, I don't need to read it, I lived it. So uh, when they came uh, west, they didn't have any skills as far as forestry or really know what to do, and the family lived in uh, wall tents. The canvas like hunting style tents in the snow in the Sun Valley country in Idaho. And uh, obviously there wasn't a lot of farming there, the forest hadn't been cleared there, and so they went into the woods and started working as loggers in the forest. And they set up a little uh, sawmill uh, using uh, one of their cars, an old Model A. They used that to drive the sawmill. And uh, the three boys and my great great grandfather went to business and in, in, in log became loggers essentially. This particular saw was the first felling crosscut saw that they purchased uh, when they came over. And this is the very one that they used in the forest. And I am so fortunate uh, to still have this. I, when I was younger, I had no interest in these things. And I remember looking at it on the wall. And I remember every year when my grandparents had a garage sale, um, the old saw got trotted out and, and uh, put a price put on it. Fortunately, very fortunately, no one ever purchased it. And uh, it, uh, it came to me. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for this. So. This is, uh, this is, this is Wanda. <laughs>